Bo told me we have three hours, which is great. It's two hours longer than any of you will be listening. So uh, you got four hours. That's good. That's good. It's an honor to be with you guys. I'm uh, super excited. Uh, got to know Skip and Bo over these last few years. And Skip actually was with us uh, at the clothing share every year. We do a clothing share for our community, and we sit down with Evangel Cubes. And Skip, I believe, last year or two years ago, got to participate in that with us. And so I've just recently done Evangel Cube training again for our folks. And uh, like he said, it's just another tool in the toolbox. If you have your Bibles, let's, let's start with God's Word. Always a good place to start. Always a good place to end. Acts chapter 4. I want us to go there. You may be asking this big word evangelism. What does it mean? It sounds scary, doesn't it? Just a big word. and it's, It sounds scary. Sounds like it could be painful. But I want us to kind of see what, uh, what we've been called to and what it is that we're doing. In Acts chapter 4, setting this up as you're turning, in Acts chapter 3, a, a lame man has been healed. Peter and John were going up to the temple. And so uh, um, at the gate called Beautiful, you know this story, and a person is healed there. And um, it, it causes all kinds of problems because people don't like it sometimes when, when uh, you see a, a Jesus movement and the authorities are kind of getting threatened. Look over in chapter 4 in verse 1. Peter and John are arrested. It says, as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Does it say they all were saved or does it say many of them? Okay, so, you know, we do the work that we do, and then God does the saving work. Moving on in verse 5, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, and the high priest was there, and Caiaphas and John, and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men, whereby which we must be saved. I want to keep reading in uh, verse 13. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John, where, where did Peter and John's confidence come from? Do you think it came from them or did it come from the power of the name? It came from the name, right? He's already he's telling you the reason we were able to do this is the name. And so continue reading. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And let's stop right there. What was it that was different about Peter and John that allowed them to be a part of this miraculous healing? Filled with the Spirit, the name of Jesus. They recognized they were ordinary men. Let me suggest to you there are people sitting here right now that are thinking, I'm going to listen to this man, but I don't have the gift of evangelism. That's for somebody else. I'm just an ordinary, untrained person, and uh, that's not for me. And I want to tell you that you are absolutely the qualified person that God needs you to be. When you have a story, a testimony that Jesus is your Savior, you have now become the world's leading expert on your salvation story. Nobody knows it better than you. You were there. You know what changed. You know what took place. Now, it might be tonight as you hear all this that you go, I don't have a story, and we'd love to talk with you about that. But assuming that you have a salvation gospel story, you are the person that all the news agencies want to talk to when it comes to you getting saved, because you, you were there. You are the world's leading expert. I've heard it said before that salvation sometimes is nothing more than one beggar telling another beggar where they found bread. That's it. What did you find? You found the bread of life. His name is Jesus. You want to tell somebody else what's happened in your life. This morning, we did a baptism of a guy who was 61 years old. He got saved at the age of nine, but he hadn't been baptized all these 51, 52 years. And so I didn't have to train him up on his story. I listened to it. I gave him a little bit of coaching on, on how to say what he was saying. But he spoke with confidence because he knew what God had done in his life. 
So I believe uh, sharing the gospel begins with knowing your story. Your story, your gospel story has three parts. And I believe you're starting to do this with baptism testimonies. Is that right? When somebody's baptized, you'll see these three parts. My life before Christ. Spiritually, what was your life like before you got saved? For many of you, you've been saved so long, you might have forgotten. It's been a long time since you got saved. Praise the Lord. That's, uh, that's grace and mercy. What was it like when you met Jesus? What, was it, what do you remember when you got saved? I can tell you that I was nine years old at Westwood Baptist Church in Cleveland, Tennessee, and I was in Bible drill. I grew up in a church home and was going to church. My brother and I happened to both be ministers. That is crazy. I can't believe that happened, but we are. And uh, by God's grace, I met Jesus as a nine-year-old, almost 10-year-old. I was studying scriptures. I was learning. Y'all remember Bible drill? where you take your Bible and they'd tell you to turn and such and such, and as soon as you got there, you'd step forward. And So I was learning all that. We were learning verses, and a couple of the verses that I was studying, one was, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? And I can remember God just speaking to me through that passage. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? And then the other passage that talks about, you may call him Lord, but you don't. many will not enter into the kingdom of heaven because you're saying all the right things, but yet your heart is not right with Christ. And so I'm reading all these things, realizing, you know, that means you've got to have a relationship with Jesus. Going to church, just having religion is not going to get it done. And so those were the verses that I began uh, learning, realizing God was drawing me. That's part of my gospel story. I know it because I was there. I remember what God was saying. So you know your story. What was your life like before you met Christ? How did you meet Christ? And then what's your life been like since Christ? And I hope you can look back at your life since Christ and you can see the fruits of the Spirit of God. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such things there's no law. I hope you can look and see a life-changing moment where you were going this direction, you met Jesus, you repented, and you turned and went the other direction. That's your story. You are the world's leading expert on that story. I hope that you will share that story as you hear. Here's what is amazing about that. When you're ready to share your story, the Bible tells us to always be ready in season, out of season to preach and to give a reason for our defense, for the hope that we have in Jesus. When you're ready to share your story, what you're going to find is your story and somebody else's story lines up. We sent a lady on her first outreach visit on Tuesday night, Jenna Harrison, Jenna Sweeney. Uh, Jenna Sweeney now, you knew her as Jenna Harrison. And uh, she went on her first outreach visit. We had it planned who was going to share the testimony and who was going to share the key question and all that got there, and the lady's testimony they were witnessing to was the same as hers. This lady was already saved, but they, I mean, immediately they had a connection, and it's like, this is so cool when God matches up testimonies. I think you're going to find, how, how many of you would say, my testimony's not that interesting? There's other people, you know, I don't have the, was running with drug dealers and all that stuff, and so a lot of times we think, you know, I grew up in a church, so I don't feel like mine's that exciting. What I will tell you is God will match my testimony up with somebody else, where it lines up exactly, and so that's your story is an exciting story because God is in it. So where does evangelism begin? It begins with knowing where the power comes from. In this story we just read, where did the power come from? The Spirit of God, the name of God, the name of Jesus. Don't ever forget the power of the name. For salvation is found, no other name uh, under heaven given among men whereby which we must be saved. The power is in the name of Jesus. So your Jesus story is that Jesus changed your life you met somebody who knew everything you had ever done, and he loved you still. He demonstrated enough that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. That's your story. Begin there. Begin evangelism with your story. As Bo mentioned, I like to teach evangelism as tools in the toolbox. Men, especially, when you go to work on a, on a project, you don't ever know what you're going to need, do you? You, you? you load up all the tools. I was on a mission trip to Kentucky a couple weeks ago, and I met this guy that had made a trailer. And I mean, everything had its place. It was the coolest thing. I've, I got to get one of those. Every tool had a place. It was labeled, stuff pulled out and folded out. And it was just awesome, like a transformer for tools. So when you show up, when that man shows up on the, tools, on the site, he's got a tool for every need. That's evangelism, a tool in the toolbox. The Evangicube, by the way, you all will not be using some quite as big as the one that I have. So uh, I don't think you're going to be using this one, but I'm using this one to teach you tonight. This is simply a tool. This is not the gospel. This is simply a tool to help us share the gospel. Um, Bo mentioned the gospel is the gospel, but there's many different methods. And so that's what I want to try to teach you is different methods for sharing the gospel. 
Um, we began just by understanding sharing the gospel is simply one beggar telling another beggar where they found bread. You found one who knew everything about you. You're going to share your story. You're going to share the gospel with them. I'm grateful that living in the day and age that we live in, that now there are a lot of evangelism tools for our phones. And the reason I like that is I always have this with me. I'm, I'm probably not always going to have this with me because this is a little inconvenient to travel with. Uh, I, mind, I love to share Jesus without fear in New Testaments. I, I like to carry that one around, but I don't always have it with me. Here, I've always got an app. There are several different apps that I use. If you look in my gospel folder, I've got to share Jesus without fear. I'm going to talk with you about life in three circles. There's an app for that. There's lots of different gospel apps. So I, after we're done, I can kind of talk with you guys uh, about that. So here's some things I want to talk with you about tonight. Sharing the gospel is about conversations, not presentations. So we, I think those of us that learned gospel back in the year, you got to learn what to say. How many of you took faith evangelism back in the day? Anybody? Faith, F-A-I-T-H. Yeah. Uh, so forgiveness available, impossible turn, heaven. We did that years ago. That was the method for Southern Baptists some 20 years ago. That one blew my mind. That's the hardest one to memorize. Every point had a sub point and had several different scriptures. And I, I got so confused, I jokingly said I spelled feet one time. I, I forgot what I was trying to spell because there were so many, so many letters involved. That was a presentation. I would present it. People would sit and listen. When you're sharing the gospel, you want to have a conversation. What's, what makes a conversation a conversation? Right now, we're not having a conversation. I'm presenting so there's two way, yeah, that's right. So if I'm if there's two way, that means I better also be listening, right? Not talking. And so when you're listening, the person you're sharing the gospel with will tell you a lot about themselves. There are some key questions I want to teach you tonight as we get into uh, uh, to the Evangel Cube. One key question comes from faith evangelism, and this is a great place to start when you're in a conversation and you're trying to steer it toward the gospel. Ask this key question: In your personal opinion. What do you understand it takes for a person to go to heaven? In your personal opinion. So you're asking an opinion question, which means you don't turn around and say, wrong, because you ask them their opinion. And so you're asking them their opinion. In your personal opinion, what do you understand it takes for a person to go to heaven when they die? Now you can personalize it. Bo, in your personal opinion, what do you understand it takes for you to go to heaven when you die? So I've personalized it. I've asked him. And so now that I've asked the question, because it's a conversation, I'm going to listen. And they're going to tell me a lot about what they believe. There's three types of answers to that question. One is a works answer. I believe you must go on a lot of mission trips. I believe you must give to the poor. You must take care of the widows and orphans. You must go to church, read your Bible, study, pray, all those things. Those are all works. They're good things, but those are all works. So your first type of answer you're listening for is a works answer. The second type of answer you're listening for is what I would call an unclear answer. And sometimes I've asked this question, they'll say, I don't know. I mean, that's an unclear, I don't know, I, I, I'm unsure. The other type of unclear answer is a works and faith-based answer mixed. I believe you ought to believe in Jesus and go to church. Well, now we've mixed faith and works because salvation is found and no other no name given among men whereby which we must be saved, the name of Jesus, not Jesus plus other works. So an unclear answer is where it's combined faith and works. The third type of answer is faith. And when you get a faith answer, there's some follow-up questions. So let me back up the first two types of answers, a works answer and unclear answer. If they give you that type of answer, because you ask them an opinion question, I don't say, you're awesome, that's wrong. I, I don't. What I, I, I listen, I nod, I'll go, uh-huh, and I'm just, I mean, uh-huh just means I'm listening. doesn't mean I agree. It just means I'm listening to what you're saying, and I understand what you're saying, because I asked you an opinion question. When they finish their answer, I'll say, thank you for sharing the answer to that question, your opinion. Can I share with you how the Bible answers that question? So rather than saying, you're wrong, I'm right, what I've said is, I asked you an opinion question, you gave me basically a wrong answer according to Scripture, now I'm going to ask you permission to share how the Bible answers that question. So that's how I transition into it. So Bo, let's practice. Give me a, a works answer. Just say works. So Bo, in your personal opinion, what do you understand it takes for a person to go to heaven when they die? Uh, well, to be a good person and you know, share good with other people and try and live the best way I can live. That, pretty common answer, right? You hear that quite a bit. Man, Bo, thanks for, for answering that question. Can I share with you how the Bible answers that question? I guess. 
Okay. So, all right. So, I guess he's not crazy. He thought his answer was pretty good. But so now we transition. Now I can get to the gospel because I've asked him his permission. People like to know they're being listened to. They like to know that their opinion matters. They like to know that their view, spiritual view, matters. So I listen to him. If I get an unclear answer, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to ask, he might have said, go to church, believe in Jesus, and take a bath every Saturday night. I don't know, something like that. So I'm going to say, well, can I share with you how the Bible answers that question? Now I'm into, how, now I'm into the gospel. If he gives me a faith answer, believe in Jesus, he says that, I'm going to say to him, man, that's great. Tell me about that. And, and I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to let him tell me. And if I still, he may give me the right answer because he's heard it. He's been in church his whole life and he's heard the right answer. That you must uh, confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Call on the name of Jesus. I'm going to say, tell me about that. And so I'm listening for him to say, this happened to me. And so I just keep asking. I think I could make money as a, uh, as a pres- professional counselor. Tell me about that. How'd that make you feel? You know, I'm just going to keep asking questions. I'm not giving him the answer. I'm just sitting and waiting. So if he says, well, you must make Jesus Lord of your life. Great. Tell me about that. Have you ever done that? Well, yeah, I do it. Here's the answer. We get more than not. I do it every day. We get that answer all the time. I do it every day. I mean, I pray that every time. We run into a Folks that have grown up in the Catholic Church and they've been taught these are the things that you do. And so now we talk with them about a life-changing moment. That moment where you surrendered your life to Jesus and it was no longer your life living. Now God is living his life. And so we listen for those life-changing Galatians 5, 22, 23, the fruits of the Spirit. Okay? So, yes? So I feel like, just back up for a second, a lot of times, sometimes I get a little nervous that When I ask them if I can share what the Bible says about salvation, that there's going to be a hard, negative, combative response. Okay. How often does it really get combative or negative? And if it does, what would you? I almost have to qualify this statement. Because we're pastors, people feel like they have to listen to us, you know, so we get a different response than, than you might. It is very rare. Now, keep in mind, very often I've established a relationship to get to this point. It's not always with a perfect stranger. Rarely does somebody say no. And if they do, they say, I'm sorry, I don't have time today. And so there's not necessarily a rejecting. Let me just remind you, let me free you of something. If somebody rejects salvation, Jesus, they're not rejecting you. I know that we're worried about they said no to you. They are, for whatever reason, they're rejecting the gospel. So let's back up a step. The single most important thing you can be doing in this moment and leading up to it is praying for that person. Because you pray for the Spirit to plow their hearts, for their hearts to be good soil for the gospel. So let's say he tells me no. Hey, thank you for your time. You know, we're going to end that right there, but what am I going to do between now and the next time? Man, I'm going to be praying. He's going to be on my list, and I'm going to pray. And I don't say this because I want you to think more highly of me, but this is just something I've learned to share in the gospel. I fast on Mondays, and when I've started doing that, I've seen way more salvations, way more opportunities to share the gospel. I took the summer off, wasn't doing it. I've not had the opportunity to see somebody come to faith in Christ in three months since I quit doing it. So I started last Monday back fasting. And so Bo then would be on my list every Monday, if, if no other, other time, every Monday I'm going to be praying and fasting for Bo to come to faith in Christ. And I can just tell you over time, I've seen God answer that a whole lot more. So great question. Thank you for that. Bo, do you have a water? Can I get a water? They come in. So let me just share with you. As, so now you've asked the question, the key question, and now you've asked permission to share the gospel. So what do you share? What are some components of the gospel that make the gospel the gospel? Three main components that I believe, and listen, if you remember back to the story, what is it they were upset about? That, that uh, Peter and John were sharing what? Resurrection from the dead. That's what they were talking about. So three main components of the gospel, that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he rose again. So three main components of the gospel. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. That he was buried. He was dead. Third day he rose. Uh, the Vangel Cube, you're going to see it in just a second. And then he rose again. Three main components of the gospel. What are some kind of precursors? What are some conditions that we need for the gospel? That man is sinful. We've got to set up the fact that we're in need of a Savior. When my children, one of them, my son Daniel, sitting out in the lobby, 16-year-olds driving, man, that is faith. Golly. I-95 in the rain on the way up here, that is 
I met Jesus many times in the car on the way up here. So um, when they came to me, they said, Dad, I want to get saved. I would always ask them, what do you need to be saved from? And then they would say, sin. I would say, well, tell me about that. I wanted to know about their sin. That I realized my children were ready when they could personalize. They could say, my sin. I, I have done these things. It wasn't just some concept. It was personal. And so you are, you are needing to know that, a person, that we are all sinners, we are in need of a Savior. That Savior has a name. His name is Jesus. He claims to be the only way. Amen. And that you can be forgiven of your sins. So what is the gospel? Jesus died, that he was buried, that he rose again, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that um, there is a Savior. The only salvation is found in no other name. We just read it. Uh, Acts chapter 4, no other name under heaven given among men where we're, but by which we must be saved. That Savior has a name. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. And that if we'll put our uh, faith in him and ask him to forgive us of our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And so those are the main components that we're wanting to get into. Before you can get somebody saved, you've got to get them lost. Before you can share the good news, you've got to share the bad news. And so you have to share that we're all sinners in need of a Savior. I've heard it said before, it's only good news if it gets there in time. And so we've got to make sure that we're advancing the gospel. The gospel literally means good news. So it is good news that we can be saved. Let's get into the Evangel Cube. I'm going to share uh, another method or two if we have time, but let me show you what the Evangel Cube is. So uh, we use, I think Bo's got some of these. Do I have somebody can pass these out so we can be, can somebody help me with these? There we go. Thank you. So anybody seeing this for the first time? Evangel Cube? Anybody seeing? Okay. All right. When I share this with people, very often I'll ask them, because they kind of look at it and go, wow, what is that? I'll say it kind of looks like a Rubik's Cube, doesn't it? Because it kind of looks like one of those things that you turn. And Let me just share with you that you're thinking, I'll never learn how to do this. This is complex. It has instructions on it of how to turn, where to turn. You're also probably thinking, I can break it. I used to say you can't until my friend Chelsea did, but it's pretty rare to, to break an Evangel Cube. These are much easier, the bigger ones, to break than the smaller ones. So this is simply a pictorial story. I saw the slide you guys had for the gospel, and I love that word story. This is simply a pictorial help or a tool for helping you uh, tell the story. So while you're getting your Evangel Cubes, and we're going to practice here in a second with these, let me just show you that on this, this is going to be our starting point, okay? The starting point, will have a number one up here in the, uh, the top, in the middle. It's got pink arrows with a number one, and it's telling you that we're starting on number one. And we're going to be uh, starting from this point. I want to show you on the back of number one is this slide. It has a heart in the middle of it, and it has some other icons. We'll talk about that in a second. Let's go back to number one. And so you've got a little piece of paper in there that tells you what to say. It, it's in uh, English and Spanish. For those of you that are OCD and you want to say everything exactly like it's got to be said, Bo and I have a common friend that I was sharing this with a couple weeks ago, and He's like, I'm afraid I'm going to mess up. I said, tell you what, put the piece of paper away. Tell me what that picture means. And he did great. And that's really all we're doing is walking through the picture. So before you worry about kind of turning, uh, just look up here for a second. Let me kind of show you. First slide, I want to show you that there are arrows that tell you how it's going to turn. Okay? So I'm going to just demonstrate for you, and then I'll come back and kind of teach you. This first slide represents God the Father. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There is no sin in him. He is perfect. Notice that uh, the light around him, his glory. Notice that man uh, in sin represented in red with darkness surrounding him. Notice a wall in between us, the chasm that is caused by the separation that sin causes with us and our Father. So what we're going to share is what we just said. You can't share the good news till you share the bad news. Uh, the Bible tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. A sin is anything I say, think, or do that breaks God's laws. It's when I depart from God's design and God's plan. That's what a sin is. So we can talk about Adam and Eve in the garden and the sin that they did. They chose it their own way. God said, don't do this. They said, I'm going to do it. That's us, isn't it? That's all of us. And so I'll tell my story as I go. As a two or three-year-old, I decided I wanted a piece of bubble gum from the store. And so I took it. I didn't let my mom know. She was driving. She looked over and saw my hand clenching onto something. She turned it over and there's a piece of bubble gum we had not paid for. So what does that make me? Makes me a thief. 
I've broken the law. Doesn't matter that it was two cents or three cents. I'm a thief. At three years old, I'm a thief. And so I'm, I'm sharing that we're all lawbreakers. We're all in need of forgiveness. That if my standard is be a good enough person, then a lawbreaker, a lawbreaking thief, is not a good enough person to make it into heaven, right? We would all agree with that, okay? So all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. And then I'm going to stop right there and I'm going to tell you that that should have been me on the cross. That the wages of sin is death. I am a lawbreaker. I am a thief. And I'm a liar. I probably lied about taking the bubble gum. So I'm a lying thief. I deserve death on the cross. That's who I am. That's who I was. That's my nature. But Jesus demonstrated his love that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That he loved us enough to die for us. It cost him everything. And so I'm going to tell now the gospel. Jesus died for us, that he was buried, and he was placed in a tomb. Notice those arrows telling you where to turn. He was guarded by Roman soldiers. The Bible tells us then, on the third day, Jesus rose from the grave. Now your instructions are going to tell you to talk about the angel moving the stone away. I cut to the chase very often and just will say, Jesus rose from the grave. And so when you're sharing this with kids, like at the clothing share, man, they just light up when they see this picture. It's so cool. So now we're going to go from Jesus. Notice your arrows are telling you which way to turn. I'm turning back to here. And I'm going to point out what I started with. Remember the light on the first picture and the darkness? And remember that chasm or that, that wall that was in between us? I love this song. There's a bridge to cross the great divide and there's a cross to bridge the great divide. Jesus has crossed that great divide for us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So that's an exclusive claim. I was sharing the gospel the other night with a lady who had just come uh, to our church for the clothing chair. Come to find out she had come out of the Mormon faith, the Mormon uh, church. And so I was sharing this with her a couple days ago. And I'm happy to tell you she placed her faith and trust in Jesus some time ago. She's going to be baptized here pretty soon. But it's pretty cool how God has worked in her life. Her friend came this morning. Her friend got saved this morning at church. She's coming out of the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. So uh, on Tuesday night, I'm sharing the gospel with a former Mormon, a Jehovah's Witness, and somebody, a friend of theirs who knows Jesus. And so it was really, she was there this morning as well, all from the clothing share, Skip. We've seen all of them come this week. It's been pretty cool to be a part of, okay? So reminder, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. I'm not one way, I am the way. I am the only way. What I'll do when I'm sharing this is I'll put a person's fingers, like this is my, my finger puppet, Kevin, and so I'm going to say, you know, at the age of nine, I realized I was a sinner and I had to put my faith and trust in Jesus. I had to confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. And now I have access to God the Father because I've been forgiven. And you can ask the question, how about you? Is there a time in your life you've ever done that? Okay, let's turn to the slide. Now, because so many of us are living in that good person, moral relativity stuff, uh, they'll want to say, well, I believe if I just be a good person enough, I can go to heaven. And again, that's not the standard. We can't ever be good enough. The Bible tells us that our uh, righteousness is filthy rags before God. There's no one righteous, no, not one. If somebody is still telling you they're a good person, there's a method called the good person test. It's by way of the master. If you want to look that up, there's videos to show you how to use it. You basically just walk through the Ten Commandments. So uh, what, is your, what is your name again? Yeah. So Dennis, would you tell me you're, you're a good person? You, you say you're a good person? Just, just play along. Sure. All right. Uh, have you ever told a lie? Uh, yes. If he said no, I'm going to say you just did. Uh, so, uh, yes, okay. So what does that make you? A liar. All right. So you're a liar. So by God's standard, do you think you ought to allow a, a liar into heaven? No. Okay, no. <laughs> and you can take the Ten Commandments and just go down the list. And so you can have this long list. So basically what you're telling me is you're a lying, stealing, adulterous you know, whatever. So do you think you ought, by God's standard, do you think he ought to allow you into heaven? So what I've had to do is get him to realize none of us are good people. I mean, when it comes down to that standard, thank you for playing along, Dennis. I love saying that. Have you ever told a lie? No, you just did. Because we all have, all right? So two choices, as you well know. Wages of sin is death. Gift of God is eternal life. And so you talk about the choices. I love to point out that you see the nail-scarred hands there, that... Um, uh, Jesus is reaching down for us. That's what redemption means, rescued from darkness. This is what I deserve, but God reached down. I didn't deserve it. God reached down in his grace and his mercy, and he's picked me up by the nail-scarred hands. 
There's a new song by Casting Crowns that says the only scars in heaven will be the hands that are holding you now. I love that line. I love that lyric. I was talking with their pastor a few weeks ago who, who knows them well, and I said, man, how do you come up with lyrics like that? The only scars in heaven are going to be the hands that hold you now. And I want to point out the scars there. They're the ones that are reaching down for us, okay? So now you turn back, and you're back where you started. Flip it over to the other side. If a person, person has just put their faith and trust in Jesus, God changes them from the inside. Now when you are saved, you're going to want to pray. You're going to want to read God's Word. You're going to want to have fellowship with other believers. And you're going to want to go and tell people. And that's what. Now you've got another slide on there. I'm not going to go in. It's basically about multiplying. That's the other picture I didn't talk about, okay? So let's go back to the beginning. And uh, let me demonstrate. Me and Dennis. Dennis, come on up. <laughs> Great. I'm going to demonstrate for you, okay? And then I'm going to let you guys, uh, you'll practice, okay? Dennis, are you the evangelism guy here? Yeah, yeah, yeah I thought so. I thought, I thought that's who I had. Bose told me about you. Uh, everything you said was good, by the way. I just oh, wanted you to know. So, right. so that's good. So, Dennis, have you ever, so play along. You can take me on a journey if you want to. Pretend to be lost, whatever you want to do. Dennis, uh, have you ever seen one of these? No. Uh, can, I, can I show you what this is? Absolutely. All right, so I'm asking permission. I want it to be his idea. I really want to get in there, but I want it to be his idea. Uh, man, this is called an Evangel Cube, and really all it is, it's just, it represents the Bible and how the Bible tells us we can be forgiven of our sins. So I want to show you that here on this side, this represents God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he created man for fellowship with him. The problem is Adam and Eve in the garden sinned. A sin is anything that I say, think, or do that breaks God's law. They were told not to eat of the fruit of a tree, and they decided, I want that. I don't know about you, but I can relate with that. That's me. Share thief story uh, here. Um, notice this wall. We were created to have fellowship with God, but our sin caused separation. That's darkness. That's, that's our sin. That's what it looks like. I don't know about you, but I'd rather live there. That looks good, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. A couple of uh, weeks ago, we were sharing the gospel using the Evangel Cube with somebody we'd been sharing with for over two years, and we had never used the Evangel Cube. He was dying with cancer. And we had been trying for years to get this man. We were praying and sharing. And when he saw this picture, it was like he just froze. He saw this for the first time. Do you know who that is? Jesus. That's Jesus. So Jesus died on the cross. Have you ever heard that before? And so what I'm doing is asking questions to try to find out, okay? That should have been me. But because God loved me so much, he sent Jesus to die for me. For he loved me so much that um, whosoever believes in him. I, that's you, that's me. Anybody who puts their faith and trust in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And the Bible tells us that he put him in a tomb. He was in a tomb for on the third day, guarded by soldiers. And on the third day, we recognize this at Easter, Jesus rose from the grave. And so he claimed to be God in the flesh. He claimed to have victory over death, and he demonstrated it. And he said that I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So Jesus is the only way to God the Father. Have you ever heard this before? Uh, yes. Okay, so I'm kind of trying to, I'm asking meat thermometer questions, trying to find out. Let me ask you this. To you, who is Jesus? He's God's son. Okay, so he gave me a good answer, but it's not a personal answer, is it? So let's go back now. Dennis is going to give a personal answer. To you, who is Jesus? He's my Lord and Savior. All right, so what did I get from that answer? I know he believes in Jesus, right? I'm, and I'm going to say, man, tell me about it. That's awesome. Tell me about that. So do you see how this is working? If he says to you who is Jesus, he said, I don't know. Well, that's pretty rare. You know, usually you'll get some, some kind of answer, all right? So I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We must repent of our sins, admit that we're a sinner, believe, you can use, use the ABCs here, and uh, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Is there ever a time in your life where you did that? Okay, so he's, he's playing along with me. And so now I'm just going to have a gospel conversation. Thank you, Dennis. Have a seat. Great job. Great job. Y'all, we ain't leaving until he gets saved. So that's one method. John Maxwell tells that story. He came over to somebody's house and said, brought his suitcase with him. It's the old Bear Bryant trick. You know, I'm going to recruit. I'm not leaving until you commit to Alabama. Um, so he shows up and he says, man, I'm, I'm here for you to get saved. I'm not leaving until you do. And so <laughs> I don't know if that really happened or not. And then, of course... Wages of sin is death, gift of God is eternal life, and then back to the start, okay? Practice, does everybody have a partner to practice with? And uh, so let me just say this, there is a script in the boxes. 
I'm also, I've brought this for you guys. There's the slides that I think I saw up just a second ago. These are the pictures that have a little story about the pictures and what it says. And so I brought enough of these for, uh, for Bo to, to hand out. So right now, don't worry about what to say. Just tell your story. Tell, uh, practice telling the story, what the pictures mean. And just pra- I love that basket. That's awesome. Um, practice with one another for a few minutes, okay? So just practice sharing the gospel using the Evangel Cube. Each one take turns sharing and then being the sharee, okay?